and then we test it to see if it works. It does. It's a beautiful thing when it all comes together. Yes. It's always fun to see people joining us and uh, whether you choose to show us your faces or not, we always love uh, seeing your names pop up here. Um, and uh, it's lovely to see your smiles. I know you're still out there. So if you want to uh, your faces so we can share a smile, you're welcome to uh, mute at any point, but we're just glad you're here. On a Wednesday morning, November 18th, 2020, what a year it has been. <laughs> And I think if we all think about the high points, that we should maybe type a high point in the chat box. What's going well with you? I think we know some challenges and we wanna know about those too, because we want to know how we can support you. If you have something that has just really been an aha moment, that in the chat box or unmute yourself and share it for a second. You are so right. Seeing a lot more parent involvement in AAC. You know, with all of the downsides of what we've been doing, the parent piece is one that every time I ask that question, parent piece and involvement is one of the top answers that it's a good time to show parents. And, and we've always wanted to extend these things. Why doesn't the device come out at home? Or all of over the years, we've got an opportunity now to guide families through that. And I'm, it's, it's really pretty exciting to learn telepractice and virtual connection. You, you're absolutely right. Um, a year ago, we were still having uh, to train people how to access Zoom. We can check that box off now. No more commute. <laughs> uh -huh. Exactly. Exactly. So we've got people still joining us. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. Um, and thank you for putting those comments in. And Are you able to see my PowerPoint? Yep. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. We are so glad that you could join us. If it's Wednesday morning, we are always echoing. Today, we are echoing with voices. If you have signed in, that is your record of attendance. And so you will receive a certificate for um, 1.25 contact hours for today. Uh, the session handouts, I will put those into that folder um, in just a moment, but that's where you're going to be able to find them. And uh, that same link is going to take you to all of our previous sessions that we've had, and um, we'll have all of the handouts and recordings. Uh, again, you'll be getting uh, credit. We are adding comprehension quizzes um, to our recordings so that you can watch those and get credit from um, answering 90% accuracy. So we're trying to automate that piece and um, let you get credit whatever time of the day or night. Um, as usual in the beginning, we're going to remind you that we've got Zoom closed captioning and here's how you can go there. But we'll back off on those prompts because uh, you're gonna get this and uh, you'll see it now, it's turned on. Um, if you wanted to change how that appears, you can click on your live transcript button. Uh, you can go to the full transcript, you can change the size. So these are your options. And if you, if, if you have Zoom and you're not getting these options, um, the, right now it's in beta and it is in K-12. Uh, they're expanding it to other um, uh, populations and age groups, but right now we are thrilled to be part of that beta group. Echo Voices, our second year. Um, you are welcome to contribute to this conversation. Um, everybody is muted to start with, but certainly putting comments in the chat box. We always uh, ask our presenters how they prefer to answer questions. And uh, Tabby, our guest this morning, uh, really wants to make sure she's got um, her presentation solid and would may prefer to have questions at the end. So you can let us know, Tabby, how that goes for you. 
So uh, I'm Deb, Deb Fitzgibbons. I am the coordinator of Oregon Technology Access Program and regional and statewide services for students with orthopedic impairment. That's the hat that I wear to support therapists. And as we all know, these topics and these interests uh, cross over. This is the start of my fifth year in Oregon. It feels like I just moved here, the time has flown, and I'm so thrilled to be able to uh, meet all of you and get to know you. I have no disclosure, this is my job. Uh, but I, one of the other benefits of these last few years has really been to partner with somebody who uh, has been my mentor, and I am eternally grateful for the uh, historical perspective, the uh, the present perspective and the hold that we are in making um, making change for tomorrow. So Gail, if you would, uh, tell us a bit about you and what you've got going on. Good morning, everybody. My name's Gail Bowser and I um, act as an independent consultant to several different ECHO networks. You may not know that there are well over a hundred echo and education networks um, around the country right now. Um, so I am a consultant to Echo Voices through OTAP. Also the University of Wyoming has a echo for assistive technology, which meets um, tomorrow. And um, then uh, our RSOI echo is therapy and educational settings. So I do that and a bunch of other contract work. And um, one of my great pleasures is if it's Wednesday, I'm on Echo with Deb. So good morning, everybody. Let us know how we can help you. Thanks, Gail. I'm just gonna do a couple of announcements. We have a sent out announcement for this. If you have not received this in your email, um, please, uh, uh, let me know. Uh, we've uh, had, uh, we talked to all, many of the tech people, the IT around our state to make sure that our newsletters are getting through. And now we're back to a lot of bounce back. So we want to make sure that you have this information. Right now, we are in the process of updating our web page. And in the, couple, the next couple of weeks, it's going to switch over. Um, and so it's going to give us a new, uh, a whole new ability to work with our own page. We've been uh, stymied by the program that was being used, but that will in the near future be the source that you can go to even if you're not receiving the newsletter. So uh, thanks for bearing with us. You can't join us if you don't know about us. So uh, we have a statewide town hall for therapists coming up. This is something uh, that we are doing monthly now by uh, it was started in the spring and the need does not stop with um, with the distance learning, it, it continues. So we are thrilled to be able to bring these. I will post the URL here in our chat box when I'm done. Um, we are inviting guests each time and our guests really wanna know what questions you have up front. I'm pr proud to say that this month on November 30th, our guests include Linda Brown, who's um, with ODE and she is the liaison for both of the grants that we house. Uh, Linda Williams from Medicaid, Nancy Schuberg, our executive director of the Oregon OT licensing board. Um, the PT licensing board will be there for the last uh, portion of it, but she's got some updates that she's going to share. Of course, Gail will be there. Um, and what's a party without Gail? Uh, Eli Sanders uh, from Medicaid, uh, Varlisha Gibbs, who is the who is from the National AOTA Group, and then uh, new this time too is Erin Haig. She's going. She is with the Speech Language Pathology and Audiology. So that's not a conversation that is always part of our grant uh, or part of our uh, meeting, but our SLPs uh, cross over to all of the the scenarios. So we're really thrilled. Um, and again, if you have questions, we can post those in advance. Um, Call for Presenters is out for AT Ties, our conference in the spring. If you've got something going on that really needs to be shared, I encourage you to do that. I know it's hard to think about putting together a presentation uh, right now with all the things, but there's lots of new learning going on. And if you've got something that will help your fellow therapists, we want you to share it. Um, our next Echo Ties, and this is for therapy, this is one that can apply to all of us as well. This is the Echo Ties, um, and we've got a session coming up on December 9th. 
that's all about ergonomics in the digital age. So I wanted to share that with you because we are slumping over dining room tables. We are sitting in chairs that were never meant to last through a day of Zoom meetings. And uh, Judith and Elise are going to be sharing with us some strategies um, to survive all of this. Uh, mark your calendar for Wednesday, December 2nd, when we welcome the uh, lovely and talented uh, Jane Corston uh, for Every Move Counts, Clicks and Chats. Uh, Jane, is uh, you have worked with Jane for a long time. Is there anything that you would like to say about what Jane's going to bring to us, Gail? Well, actually, she's going to have a brand new product um, to talk with us about and share the basics with uh, she and Terry Foss have been working on a every move counts clicks and chats manual for parents. Um, so it is I'm told at the publisher, and she's going to share with us. So I think we'll be the first group to ever hear about it. How exciting that is and, and maybe some of pe our people know what what every move counts is but uh, I would say that it's for those complex communicators who many people aren't accustomed to uh, looking for the signs of how they are commuting, uh, communicating. And it, so it begins really with uh, of where I saw your eyes blink. That, and so the, looking for what is it that changes uh, whenever certain um, uh, sensory uh, pieces are, uh, are um, approached. That's not a very good example, but that's the, the population. It's those who are really needing to, we're really needing to find out the responses so that we can shape communication. And Tabby may have something more to say about those things too, but we're really excited to welcome uh, Jane. Jane will also be um, at our conference in April. So get a taste of what she's got and she'll give you more when she's uh, presenting in April. Today though, we are so glad to welcome Tabby uh, with us today. And I meant to ask you the correct pronunciation of your last name, and I, I did not. I knew that was coming. It's always coming. <laughs> <laughs> I would say Wallaber. Jones Wallaber. Yeah, that's my last name. All right. <laughs> All right. So uh, Tabby is here, and, and um, the Master Pal is one that, through our other sessions, it is mentioned so often by other experts in the field of uh, communication and OGCOM. And so uh, I am so thrilled to learn more about this. And we're just meeting Tabby for the first time this morning. Tabby is, um, she is a graduate of Penn State. She has uh, been in school-based SLP in Frederick County on the East Coast. Um, she is uh, amazing in her presentation. She's got uh, an association with the Angelman syndrome, a family with autism spectrum disorders. And I know what you are bringing today is something that's going to resonate with a lot of folks. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And you may start sharing yours. And so again, I think your preference was that you would present and then ask questions and and zoom along. Is that right, Tabby? Um, yeah, I just want to make sure I can get through everything, but we'll definitely have time for questions. <laughs> okay, excellent. Take it away. All right. Um, my name is Tabby Jones Walliver. I am, again, I work on an assistive technology team for Frederick County Schools in Maryland. I also do um, um, support families through West Virginia Birth to Three. And so, and I do some consulting work. So we kind of have a lot of hats that I wear. But Model as a Master Pal is a training series that I compiled and I really did it, um, I have to confess, for my own benefit. <laughs> so it has kind of, it's grown wings and now it's widely shared, which is really exciting. But um, it really started out as a way for me to better support the teams that I work with. So let's see if I can take this in. Model as a Master Pal is an acronym and it encompasses a variety of topics that help us understand what it means to be a really fantastic exemplar communication partner. <laughs> so each letter in Master Pal um, is a different topic. We have motivate, accept multiple modalities, statements, more than questions, time. And time is twofold. It looks at both the short term and the long game. So wait time as well as the time that it takes for language to develop that growth um, component. Um, engage naturally, response not required presume potential, appropriate prompting, and let the child lead. 
So just by looking at these topics, I think that um, oftentimes when folks see the, the chart, there some are really obvious and others, it's not entirely obvious why or how those fit in, um, but it also feels really dense. And so I think that as I have traveled on my own learning journey, I have found it really useful to have a way to package these, these really important topics in such a way that we can dive in and unpack and figure out how it relates to our own experiences as an individual, as a communicator, um, as someone who shows learning and develops relationships through language. Um, because then it's much more, it's much easier for us to then um, have a have clarity on how important these these concepts are for the students who we support. So, Tabby, I know I said I wasn't going to interrupt, but could you go back to your first slide? I don't know that we mentioned that that's the link to the handouts if people wanted that. On your oh, phone, did you have sorry. a bit.ly link? There we go. <laughs> yeah, here, this is the um, link. And here, I'll actually drop this in the chat. OK, that's oh. excellent. Sorry, there it is. Well, I think I need to get out of presentation mode. Hold on. <laughs> um, I don't often use Zoom, so I and it's okay. It's just sometimes it's hard to tell. Is that a three two? Is that an O? Three two O. 32Q. Is it a Q? Okay, 32Q A T Q X. Okay, yeah. thank you so much, Alexandria. And I will not interrupt you again. So sorry. No worries. Um, master Pal does have a double meaning. So master a master is someone who is skilled, someone who is has competence um, in a given area. And then a pal is a friend. Um, so we think of a pal as somebody that you want to spend time with. So when we're thinking about what it takes to be a really good communication partner, at the heart of it is the relationship. How do we, how do we develop the skills and the attitudes, the mindsets and the belief systems to become that really valued, competent um, companion or, or friend, that person the individual wants to spend time with. There are two key under, understand, essential understandings that underpin uh, Master Pal. The first among these is that communication is not compliance. So Master Pal really endeavors to unpack um, the behaviors, the belief systems, the language, the practices that we need to put forth in order to support autonomous communicators. So we want the individuals whom we are work with whom we are working to, um, to know that their unique voice is being heard um, through their interactions with us. And everyone is a communicator. So we're really focusing on all the ways that kids communicate through body language and through their their tools, their devices, the environment, um, and then just those natural interactions that happen. The second essential understanding is that teaching AAC is often not intuitive. There's a lot of um, assumptions that staff and fa families bring to the table when they think about what does it take to support AAC. Imitation is something that um, I often see and you know, just understanding that telling someone what to say is not communicating is an important, is, is an important takeaway. Um, being able to recognize that, that interactions that are goal oriented rather than relationship focused can also undermine authentic communication. Um, owning this idea and, and having insight about um, the fact that communication is transactional, that communication partners are at least 50% of the equation. So the contributions that they make influence the contributions of, of the other. So this give and take um, has to be, has to take place. It has to unfold for that um, authentic communication. Another key idea is that intrinsic motivation is really at the core of authentic communication. So if an individual isn't interested, we might perceive that they're not, that they're, um, we might perceive that they're not communicating when in fact they are communicating, but they're not interested. So we all uh, communicate about things that are motivating to us. So these are two key things that I really wanted to um, support teams in expanding their understanding. So Master Pal, again, it's, there's lots of modules that are included and I have found it useful to start to sort of uh, create these umbrella ideas and then, um, and then put, um, explore modules within that. So under the umbrella of Speak AAC, we're gonna look at modeling, um, what that means, and also a little bit of the misnomer about that term. 
and as well as time in terms of the language development. Um, and power communication is going to look at presuming potential, motivate, and accept multiple modalities. We're going to look at um, engaging students by using statements more than questions and understanding that a response is not required. Safety interaction topics include wait time, appropriate prompting, and let the child lead. And then at the very end, engage naturally helps us to synthesize a lot of the themes and threads that are interwoven throughout MasterPal. And then we'll do questions. And then after that, we'll talk a little bit about planning and prioritizing how you, how, you, know, you can use these modules in your own practice. So this is a really pared down version. I literally have one or two slides about each topic so we can get through that and then get to questions. This is an introduction. Um, but MasterPal is, let me go back, <clears throat> is a Google folder. And inside that Google folder, there is a Google slide for every one of these topics. There's a facilitator guideline. And the facilitator guideline gives you a slide by slide. Um, it's a chart that goes slide by slide and tells you the talking points of each slide. So you, you don't have to be an expert in order for, to facilitate these conversations. It's really packaged so that you can um, you can guide these, these um, conversations around these topics. There are videos included, there's some interactive activities, um, there's handouts, there's also self-reflection guides. So it's really packaged so that you can go module by module, take, the, take the, the resources related to that module and then share it with others, facilitate conversations. Um, okay, so speak AAC. We're gonna look at modeling and wait time. This is where it falls on our grid. Modeling, um, it's interesting. I think that the, the term model has really come under discussion. It's the lay term that we use to talk about how we use math-related language to support AAC. Um, so just for the purposes of clarity, when I use the word model in Master Pal, we're really, I'm really thinking about how do we use our words or how do you use your, speak your words and use AAC? Um, there are times when, you know, imitation during explicit instruction may be useful, but when we're engaging in an interaction and when we're supporting the relationship and when we're developing um, competence and um, fostering engagement, we really want the conversation to be naturalistic. We want it to be reflective of the, um, the personality of the individual as well as ourselves. So we speak our words, we use AAC. And when we do this, we teach kids really important ideas about communication and interaction. We teach them how to control and influence their environment and express their individuality because we are doing so and we're using their tool to do it. We show them how to build and sustain relationships, how to demonstrate understanding about what they're learning and what they see in their, their world and their environment. Ultimately, we teach them that communication is powerful. We also teach kids, you know, more um, sort of the logistical or the pragmatic aspects of managing a device. We teach them how to combine words to create meaning as well as to change meaning. We teach them how to fix mistakes. When we think aloud as we are navigating their tool to find a certain word, we're giving them feedback about the organization and the navigation. When we use function tools, you know, so when we're looking for that clear button or the back button or, um, you know, whatever tools, or if it, as we're flipping pages or using tabs, we're giving them input about how things are organized. And we also teach them that language is messy. And I, I find this to be beautiful because when we teach kids that language is messy, then we really open up the, the doors to just diving in. We're not waiting to be experts. We're not waiting to be perfect. It gives us permission um, to just be engaged and engaging and to invite kids into that too. So we're not looking for perfection from them. We just, we just want them to be a part of it. Um, so it really is an invitation. Language development really informs the way that we model and support kids. Um, the key idea under, in this module on, about language development is that it is a process that occurs over time. It's not we provide a device and bam, magically, the child's gonna tell us everything that's on their mind. Um, but this is a process that occurs over time and, it, and it, it develops in response to the motivations and the interactions that are shaped by an individual's environment and relationships. And this is really key because this really puts front and center the fact that the communication partner has a tremendous important role in helping that child develop language. And language is both a receptive and an expressive, um, you know, there's ex receptive and expressive skills and both of those are supported. Um, in this process. 
as we speak AAC, as we speak our words using AAC. Um, I find it really, for some teams, it becomes just grounding, I, I guess is maybe the right word, when we sort of unpack the idea that language development occurs over time and that learning to use AAC also happens over a period of time. And just because it takes a child a long time to maybe get started or to show progress, it doesn't mean that um, they're not capable. It just means that this is part of the process. So I think it's important to recognize that, you know, from birth to age one, the huge amount of language development that occurs receptively and expressively. And then from age one to age three, oh my goodness gracious, there's just such a burst of, you know, a, a, a one-year-old has a handful of words and a three-year-old has all the questions and never stops talking. <laughs> and then by five, kids are really using, you know, a, an even more advanced and sophisticated level of, of language. But three, zero to five years is not a very long time, but yet there's tremendous growth in that time. It's an explosion. But also that language isn't an activity. We don't, you know, we don't write it on the calendar. It's embedded. Um, and also this idea that adults are not gatekeepers of words. So this allows us to kind of dive into the conversation about giving kids four or eight words isn't gonna give them the opportunity to develop language. We need to give them lots of words and they'll choose the ones that are meaningful to them. They will choose the words that are going to allow them to express their personality and demonstrate their learning and engage with you in a way that's meaningful to them. When we look at language development, we also unpack some of those exploratory language behaviors that um, kids might demonstrate. So babbling, self-talk, and repetition are all part of typical language development. Kids are going to babble before they're going to say real words. And so when AAC users um, engage in these exploratory behaviors, it is often perceived as a behavior problem <laughs> or um, or a STEM behavior or not functional or not useful. But I think we really need to be thoughtful about what the student is learning or doing with in, through that experience. Um, for some, they may be gaining ownership of their voice. By exploring, it might not sound purposeful to us, but they might really be learning about navigation through that. Um, they might be more purposeful than we recognize. Uh, when we respond meaningfully, even to random things, we're given feedback that helps kids con make connections and um, generate meaning and, and perhaps pro it might provide some motivation for them to continue to explore with increasing purpose. And just um, being aware that it, it, these behaviors are not stimming, they are part of natural language development um, can, can help us to, to better understand the process that our students are going through. Okay, so the next umbrella sort of topic that we're gonna look at is empowering communication. And empowering communication includes producing potential, motivate, and accept multiple modalities. This is where it falls on our master pal framework. And I um, presume potential notice is really towards the end of the acronym, but it is, a, it is a topic that I prioritize and I often try to present fairly early on. And the reason for this is that this conversation is really useful um, in establishing where we're coming from and what this is really all about. It helps to get everyone on the same page as far as expectations um, for students as we move through. Presume potential is a module that I often take a little slower than the others. Um, I think it's important that people come to that people come to this in general with different ideas about what it means or what it looks like for their students um, or the, the their child or the individual that they're working with. So when we're talking about presumed potential, I think um, for some we're really trying to shift and move the needle, but you can't really mandate a mindset. So people need to come to this um, with an openness and a sense of safety that they can ask the tough questions and, and have um, to, to improve their understanding. This module includes several videos so that we can demonstrate through video what it looks like to presume potential. Um, it includes input from families about what it means, what it feels like to presume potential in their child. So this is a really thoughtful module. And um, there, there's guidance in the facilitator guideline about how to work through this. But I love this particular quote because the imagery of it is, is beautiful and it really encapsulates everything um, that we feel and experience around presuming potential. There's nothing in a caterpillar that tells you it's going to be a butterfly. So when we look at presumed potential, I think at the very, um, very core of it, 
we're looking at an improved quality of life. When we presume potential, we innately create interactions that are richer and more meaningful. And it's not just for the individual who uses AAC, who feels that, that warmth and that, um, that, that sense of, you believe in me and I'm inspired by that, but also it improves the quality of life for the communication partners of those who use AAC. When we innately presume their potential, we're always looking for how we can expand their experiences and expand their skills. And as we're doing that, we're, um, the richness of the interactions continues to grow and shift and expand. And then if any others that are in the environment, whether it's family or staff or members of the community who observe interactions where presuming potential is at the core of it, they get the sense of the value um, of that interaction and that individual as well. So kind of going off of that, when we are presuming potential in an individual, we really want to focus, we want to be really aware of how, what motivation looks like for that individual. So intrinsic motivation is that it comes from the inside. It's that satisfaction, that social interaction, the level of you know, high interest that we're looking for. Um, you know, we all have things that intrinsically motivate us. Extrinsic motivation are those things that come from the outside. And then I have this additional idea around motivation that I, I always feel um, needs discussion as well. And this is this, the, the sense that we have comfort and confidence in things that are predictable when we know what's coming next and when we can anticipate it. And that can help to build the intrinsic motivation to want to try and be ready for, for it. So Karen Kangas is an OT um, who works with kids with complex bodies. And she has this great way of describing that um, you know, access is really based on motivation, not the device. So it's really about the activity and not the device. And one of the pieces that she really pulls out of that is that when we have a beginning, a middle, and an end to a task, it helps to build neural pathways. And those neural pathways build comprehension and or build um, understanding and skills. So it really ties into this, this piece of being inherent in readiness. So for our kids, things, intrinsic might mo motivation might be experienced as like a high five, that social connection. Extrinsically, we might look at edibles. Um, this readiness piece might be represented by a picture schedule and, and understanding how important those can be for some of our kids to, to be able to move through their day. But what I really try to unpack through this motivation, um, this module on motivation, is that we often start with extrinsic motivators. And that's an okay place to start, but we really need to make sure that we are tapping into what is an intrinsically motivating to individuals in order to build their communication. We might be able to target some specific skills through extrinsic, but it's not, it's not sustainable. So when we create a sense of readiness about learning and we build on that, we, we use that to help build up our intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation is really where the connection comes from. And it also ties into the self-determination model, which, which is also impacting that model. The motivation is so important because when we don't have motivation, um, the experiences of both the, the partner and the individual are decreased. We see less learning, disinterest in communication. We see this shift towards things becoming compliance tasks. Um, Negative behaviors may start to emerge. Learned helplessness may also um, may also become evident. So one way, so building on that building on that motivation piece, we um, also look at how what it look what it means to accept multiple modalities. So we want to validate all the attempts that an individual uses um, to teach them that communication is power, and this helps to inform us about what is motivating to them intrinsically. So when we're looking at successful communication, we want to find this balance. What, what tool, tools or modes are effective? Um, if, a, if a child can point to request, that's really effective and efficient. You know, they might not go through the effort of looking for it on their device. So just recognizing we can, we can honor that. And then, um, but we can also support them in learning their tool by using it ourselves to give them feedback about what we see. So if a child is using body language, pointing, gestures, eye gaze, we label what they're doing and we use their device to give them more information. So in this way, we're not saying use your talker and undermining their communicative effort. We're honoring their communicative effort and then we're responding 
to them, giving more information using their tools. So that's where the, the modeling or the speaking AAC happens. So we can repeat what they say or reframe it, of course, extend it and give those natural consequences. When we empower communication, we are developing the sense of I am in students um, by, by attributing meaning. Um, a lot of our kiddos, they, they're passive participants. Things happen to, for, and around them. So it's really um, incumbent upon us to provide feedback to their communicative intents, to recognize where motivations lie in their environment, and to presume the, um, that they will always be a learning, They're, they are learners and communicators, and you know, it's our job to, to continue to expand that for them. Um, Daniel was a student that has really brought home for me the importance of, of sort of the, this combination of modules of empowering communication. Um, he is a kid who is included in his neighborhood school with paraprofessional support. He has cerebral palsy. Um, he uses a wheelchair. And ultimately, um, he, you know, at the time that, that I think that he really spoke to me in terms of these modules, he did not have a robust device. But he does now. He uses an eye gaze. He uses um, an accent with eye gaze. But here's, this, here's his story. He is a student who was, re, who was very affectionate and who was very aware of when those who worked with him valued him and saw his potential and value and you know were tuned into what motivated him and it, on his team we had this interesting um there was this interesting divide and this was persistent i actually first met him when he was two years old and as he moved up through school there was this persistent divide in the staff that worked with him there was the staff that worked with him who perceived that he um was not easily motivated, who um, he was lethargic and apathetic much of the time. Um, he really didn't demonstrate what he was learning in any you know, significant ways. <clears throat> and then there was staff that worked with him that saw tremendous potential in him and felt like he had such a brightness about him and who could engage with him and um, really got a sense of his sense of humor. And the difference was really in how they perceived his potential and he knew it. So he played to it. <laughs> and he would, when he was interacting with someone who he knew did not believe in him, he would cry or he would drop his head and pretend to sleep or be sick and be taken to the nurse's office because he wasn't going, it just became very clear to me that he wasn't going to assert the effort to interact with that individual when he knew that they weren't going to they weren't going to take it and run with it. And, and then he had staff that worked with him. He had one teacher that, and that was just remarkable. And she attributed meaning to every action that he gave. She spoke with him so intelligently and so, um, so much like his peers. And he gave her everything he had. So he really thrived when others believed in him. And he really um, did not put any, he did not assert any effort with those who did not because it just wasn't worth it to him. He taught me as I was developing, you know, especially that presumed potential model, he is a student that really sat in my head um, because he just, um, he spoke to me so, you know, with such depth. So the next um, set of modules is engage them. And this one includes statements more than questions and response not required. And this is where they fit on the framework. The bottom line here is that statements, um, if we're always putting, if we're always asking kids questions, if we're always giving them opportunities to interact with us that are based on a question, then they're really limited in how they can respond. It, it actually diminishes the, the quality of the interaction. So we use statements um, to think aloud. When we're thinking aloud, we're self-talking, we're taking a turn. Um, I find that adults are often hesitant to take a turn in an interaction. They want to give all the turns to the kid. But the fact of the matter is that a lot of kids need to see you do it in order to know how to do it. Commenting is a great think aloud strategy, a great way to provide language input, because it's always relevant. No matter what's happening in the environment, who's there, what the topic is, we can always comment. And when we comment, we really give, we extend um, understanding about, about that item, you know, whether it's gross or it's funny or it's um, interesting or exciting. When we comment, we're giving you know, important information. We can problem solve aloud. The idea is that we're, we're narrating about what's happening around us. And then we follow that up with open-ended questions. 
And those open-ended questions allow kids to respond in any way through any modality. And then we attribute meaning to that. Descriptive language is another way that we can use statements more than questions. <clears throat> and this avoids that, you know, that testing that can often emerge. Um, descriptive language is really useful in academic environments. We use, we talk about attributes and actions. We discuss relational concepts. We unpack academic concepts. Um, and then we invite participation by asking questions that are valid and meaningful and that kids can answer with the vocabulary they have access to. Open-ended questions, um, again, these, these are the questions that allow kids to respond in really any way, any way um, that you can get insight into what they're thinking. And it's not a, a specific right or wrong answer. So what do you think about that? How does it make you feel? Tell me something that happened or what you learned about. Um, what part do you find interesting? What do you think of? So anything that from very generic to how are you making connections to what did you learn? Response not required is the extension of statements more than questions. Because when we're using statements more than questions, we're giving kids lots of input. Um, but how they respond or if they respond is, you know, that's not something we can always account for. And we don't want to get into a power struggle. We really want it to be open-ended. And we need to know how we can keep that conversation going. So this is often rooted in this misconception. And this is this example is really drawn from kind of an academic perspective, but it really it relates to lots of interactions. There's a misconception that AAC is only an expressive tool, but in fact, AAC facilitates receptive as well as expressive. And we have to use it expressively in order for kids to develop the ability to use it expressively. The challenge in this is that in a classroom discourse, there is an expectation of responding. But when we look at language development, ample modeling over time and across contexts without expectation of a response is how language development happens. So we have a little bit of, um, I, I think this helps to frame what we can expect from kids and why a it might not be necessary to require a response, but we can still keep the conversation going. We can say something like, you don't seem to have an opinion on this one, let's check with a friend. Mm -hmm. Or we can note what we see and attribute meaning to that. I can see that you are thinking and looking, I wonder if, and then fill in the blank. We can offer our own opinion, so we can continue to provide that, that language input. I think it's scary, or funny, or interesting, and then elaborate on what's interesting. Um, you can also give an out, Again, going back to motivation, if kids are not interested and engaged, then they're probably, you know, the, the learning that's happening is might be minimal. So we can we can also say something like, you don't seem interested, let's try something different. Amy is a student um, I have worked with who she is one of those amazing kids that teaches you more than you teach <laughs> um, them. And she is a student who has uh, spastic cerebral palsy. Um, she has CVI and she has an intellectual disability as well. She is using um, a two switch scanning on a high tech device and she has a reputation for being a practical joker. She partnered up with a teacher early on in her, her, in her learning when she was in elementary school and they went around the school together and played practical jokes. So when you see the two of them coming, even though they're not even on the same you know, level, grade level, wings anymore, um, you know, there's trouble. So she is a kiddo who we were really late to get her communication. I mean, she had um, she had simple voice output devices and some paper-based um, low-tech partner assisted scanning, but she had a lot, she's had a lot of different teachers in her um, school experience. And she is a, she's a complex kid and some people really caught on to how to interact with her and others didn't. And so we were, we were pretty late in getting her access to a, to a robust system. But in getting her access, she has grown in just these incredible ways. So when she first got the system, she had a team that was super invested and they learned how to navigate her system and they modeled a ton. They were great. Um, and as they modeled, you could see her learning in real time. You could see her access the words that, that her, her um, her staff were accessing. And prior to having access to that tool, there was a lot of choice making in her world. And so it was really unclear like how much she knew and what she was capable of. And once she received access to a device where the language of 
of living could be modeled through core words. It changed everything for her. So her staff were great about self-talk and they were great about using descriptive teaching. Um, and it showed in, in so many interactions with her. And then the next year she had a staff that um, were really new to AAC and they, they didn't model as much. The, the learning curve was much greater. And um, you could see that her ability to use her device, you could just see it kind of plateau and level out because she was really dependent upon that she really um, was, she benefited so greatly from the model, modeling that happened through self-talk. So her, her receptive and expressive language, you could just, it was like a mirror. You could see what was happening in her environment. Not all kids give us that direct feedback. We don't see that as vividly. Um, so she always sticks in my mind because it was such, um, it was so evident. So she has continued to grow and she's, um, she's a really powerful communicator. So our next umbrella is shape, um, shaping the interaction. And this looks at wait time, appropriate prompting, and let the child lead. And this is where it fits. Um, wait time, I don't know about what your experiences are, but wait time is one of those things. Like wait time and appropriate prompting are two topics that administrators will often come to me and be like, I really need help figuring out how to support my staff with these two topics. These two modules, I find myself doing just kind of as one-offs. Um, at the request of administrators. So wait time um, is something that we know kids need. There's a great video in this module that looks at what how um, kids in a general ed environment benefit from wait time. You know, it's, it unpacks a little bit of the science behind it. For kids with, who are learning you, um, to use AAC and have complex learning needs, we are really looking at um, the benefit of wait time to support processing, vision, motor planning, and in some cases, all of the above. So we want to be observant as kids are, are processing that or they're experiencing that wait time and observe if, if, they're changed, if there are changes in their behavior, you know, we know that their brain is thinking. Appropriate prompting um, is another one that, I, um, again, staff, I, I think that in a lot of environments, there are people on a, on a team that are well-versed in what prompting looks like, and then there are individuals who are supporting a student who are not well-versed in what appropriate prompt, a prompting hierarchy is and how it works. So we are looking here at the fact that aided language is really the umbrella, and then prompting falls underneath of that. Um, we first off want to start off with creating something that's sufficiently motivating that it's worth it for the child to want to participate and talk about it. And then at every level of the prompting hierarchy, we want to provide wait time so that the student has time to respond. So it's the systematic way of supporting kids to learn skills. And they should only be used when necessary, only for as long as necessary. Um, and when we are not using appropriate prompting, we see that um, when there's a mismatch to the student's skill and we prompt for too long or, or too much, then we see prompt dependence. Um, this also emerges when interactions elicit compliance rather than communication. So this, the importance of prompting and wait time is that it can really undermine our efforts if we're not managing these two pieces well. So Max is a student, and I actually have a video of Max, um, but I do not have permission to share it. So I always have to talk about it. Max is a kiddo who, um, he's a second grader, he uses a wheelchair, um, he has cerebral palsy and CBI, and um, I think autism is also part of his diagnosis. And the, in the video, he is listening to music through a switch adapted um, music player. And the music goes off and he has to activate the switch in order to turn it on. And it's a big red switch. So it's in the middle of his tray. Um, and he just has to hit the switch in order to turn the music back on. And I had seen staff, you know, often helping him, like coming over and kind of moving his hand, doing that hand over hand piece um, to get him to activate it. And we were having this conversation at the school level about wait time. And I was like, let's just give it to him and see what he does. So in this video, I start recording, the music goes off and you can see his head, you know, kind of rock back and forth a little bit. And you can see his fingers start to wiggle ever so slightly. And when the video gets to 55 seconds, he reaches out with abs the most fluid motion and he arcs his elbow and bam, nails it right in the center of the switch. And he turns his music back on and you know, he's jamming out, rocking back and forth. It took him 55 seconds of wait time to coordinate the process and coordinate that muscle motion, that, that motor movement, but he was able to do it. And it really shifted the way we started to support him because 
once we had that number, we had that number of 55 seconds, we knew that he really needed extended wait time. And at that point, autonomous communication was able to be supported in a much more effective way because we had such, we had good insight into what, um, you know, the fact that his wait time was really extensive. Let the Child Lead is a module that um, is really targeted at some of the most complex kids that I think we can, we, I know that I have worked with. And it is, the foundation of it is that learning emerges from meaningful social emotional experiences. We have to connect with kids if they are gonna connect with us and allow us into their world. So um, this invites teams to really honor that journey that kids may travel from being preoccupied with the environment or with sensory seeking experiences to a place where we can establish joint attention with them. And then we can start to build some early emergent communication awareness and skills. And then ultimately we're gonna build to that, that ownership of learning, communicating and participating as a social partner. These are some of the kids for whom I think that if we're not presuming potential from the beginning, we're not scaffolding the skills that they need to develop to, to learn and grow. Joey is a kiddo that um, I first met when he, he came in a couple months into the school year into an pre inclusion pre-K classroom. Um, and when I, and his teacher called me and said, I have a kid who is nonverbal and I need an iPad. <laughs> I was like, okay, let's let me come take a look. And when I came out to the classroom, um, this is a student who really wasn't engaging with anyone in the classroom. He would go over to the blinds and he would run his fingers down. He would walk along the bookshelf and run his fingers along all the books and you know, spill some of them, but not necessarily all of them. He was a kid who would wedge himself into tight corners. He was clearly a sensory seeker. And, um, and he had needs that weren't being met. So we had to do a little bit of wraparound service to get to a place where we could establish joint attention with him. And once we did, we started off with some low-tech AAC to introduce him to symbols in a way that wasn't overstimulating. And we were able to build to, to, to providing him an iPad, but he was not a kid that, you know, by listening to his teacher, by you know his teacher just saying, I need an iPad. I think if we had started there without the joint attention and just kind of put it in his, in his space, we wouldn't have gotten the, um, the, that, uh, that report, necessary rapport to really build communication and connection in order to support his learning. So he really, um, he's a kiddo that, again, he's one of those kids that you learn from. And I've, I've actually had lots of Joeys in, in my experiences, um, but they invite us to observe them and, and figure out what makes them tick and to kind of put aside our own agenda. So that's really what, what the child lead is all about. The last module we're gonna, that, that um, is in here is synthesizing Master Pal, it's engaged naturally. And when we engage naturally, um, this again, it's sort of a thread that, that binds many of the other modules together. The key idea in engage naturally is that in communicative interactions should be person focused and responsive to the activity and the environment. And that is going to look different for different kids, but this is really our key idea. Um, things to consider when we're engaging naturally are what do communication opportunities look like? Where are they? How can we expand upon them and refine them? Semantics, um, changing the language that we use to honor the communicative you know, interaction can be really important. When I hear teams say, hit the switch, um, I really want to revise that and say, what do you have to say? That is a much more appropriate prompt um, for supporting communication. It, again, revisits language development. It also um, dives into emotional competence a little bit. Our kids don't have a lot of experiences um, oftentimes processing their emotions and giving language to emotion. We all benefit from being able to vent. So what does that look like for our kids who use AAC? How can we support them to help them understand um, the labels for their feelings and how to um, describe what happened and, and make a plan for how to, how to cope or how to move on or how to, how to deal differently next time. Um, and then self-determination self is again revisited. Um, also in motivation, but looking at that, those interlocking circles of autonomy, competence, and relatedness in order to um, help individuals really maximize their potential. Um, through this module, one of the focuses is that we, the different kids need different things. So I actually find this particular slide to be really, when I work with groups, this, we spend a lot of time talking about different kids needing different things. So I think that when we, like, I think about my own kiddos, I, you know, my 
my personal kids, my boys, <laughs> I, I can look at this list and I can pull out, oh yeah, that's my eight-year-old and that's my six-year-old. And when I have done Master Pal with families, they can go through not just their child who uses AAC, but their other children as well. And this really helps us to tune in to those person, what does it mean to be person focused for individuals? The goal with the goal here is really to not create an echo, but to hear the authentic voice. So how can we support teams, support individuals, support families to be those most, you know, those those communication partners that allow that authentic voice to shine through. Okay. I probably went a little long, but we have a little bit of time. So what, um, I think it's time for a Q&A. Okay. So much great information. I'm, I'm processing all of that and trying to think of what my questions are. And maybe you are too, yeah. but- so That's um, why every module is individual. <laughs> this is just an overview. <laughs> Right. If you were doing a full-fledged master pal training, how long do you usually um, allow for that? What's well, to be perfectly honest with you, master pal is really meant to be delivered over time. Um, when I set out to kind of pull these pieces together, I was looking for a way to have a sustained conversation. So when in my role as an AT consult, consultant in my district, I, people, they're like, we need training on, and they don't really know what they need training on. They don't, they can't define it. We need training on this device, or we need training on how to use, how to implement AAC. And I had one particular team that was always asking for it. And I'm like, we've, we've had so many conversations, where do we need to go with this? But there were always, I felt like there's always more pieces to include. So this was a way for me to package a lot of those topics. And then I could go out once a month or you know, twice a month over a period of time, and we could have a sustained conversation. When I provide training in the beginning of the year, and then I check in with teams in the middle of the year, they've kind of lost it. You know, we all go to trainings, and then two weeks after we've gone, oh, that was so good, but I don't remember it, and I'm not doing it, and what's one piece I can pull, I know I'm not going to remember most of it. But in providing this sort of, uh, these, I don't know, it's like this package, this framework, we can revisit these topics over time. And that allows us to have that sustained conversation. And there's a lot of overlap. You know, they don't, they don't, we've, they've, they've been brought into a silo, but they're really not silos. There's a lot of intersecting information and concepts. So there's some questions showing up in the front now that um, I wanna know the answers to. Um, so Debbie says, would you, present things differently to parent groups versus professionals? Um, I think I don't present them very differently, but what I will sometimes do is pull out examples that are school-based versus examples that are relevant at home, like within daily routines. So if I'm including, um, you know, like in the statements more than questions, that's actually a really dense module with tons and tons of examples. I would probably emphasize the ones that are related to daily routines and home and leisure activities, as opposed to the examples that are academically oriented. Um, so I think that there's some, some subtle things. Um, I think, you know, I always look at what the, um, I think both with families and with staff, you can look at a group and, and know that they are either really new to AAC or they've had a lot of experience with it. And I think that I try to adjust according to that as well. Um, so I think it really is more, a little more specific, not to those two kinds of groups, but um, you know, what people bring to the table. So uh, here's another question for you. Rosanna says, how can we better support and advise parents who interact with their child primarily through quizzing? What's, <laughs> what are, and I think maybe not only parents, this is my personal editing of this question, but what do we do about the, the people who want to give quizzes? <laughs> Um, well, the statements more than question model module is all for them. I might put that really early. I might prioritize that one. Um, statements more than questions. Again, this was just a really brief insight, but that module really unpacks and goes into great depth. There's also a lot of companion resources that are 
you know, links to articles or handouts or videos that are related to the different modules that are included in the facilitator guidelines. There is a video from the Angelman Syndrome Foundation. They did their um, AAC communication training series, and it is called Don't Ask, Do Tell. It's a 33-minute webinar. The first 17 minutes are pure gold <laughs> on this topic. So honestly, I will sometimes pull that piece out and I'll send it and I'll say, we're, this, is, this, is some, this is a preview of what we're going to talk about um, at our next session. Um, take a look and bring your questions. And then if they're already sort of primed for it and have some of that foundational information. One of the things about Master Pal is I tried really hard not to reinvent the wheel. I've pulled things together, but I have really um, looked to what others have developed and tried to, to really, you know, put that out there, um, you know, within within each module. You know, so, go ahead. Oh, I, I just wanted to compliment you on that and also say that um, one of my big initiatives in the in the personal work I do has been assistive technology implementation. I'm not a speech therapist or, you know, and I don't primarily focus on AAC, but what you created um, is something that we're very much lacking in the field, I think, is the how do you talk about, you've done the assessment, you've got the devices, you you know the goals, but then what do you do? And I think we've always kind of assumed that you said, okay, here's the stuff, go forth and teach, you know? <laughs> so um, I, I, there were many ideas in what you presented today that I think apply to assistive technology in general and not just, uh, there's a lot very specific to AAC, but um, Thank you. Nothing is one and done. Uh, you, the idea that you said that it's really, it's, it's part of the coaching because if somebody sits and gets it all at one time, how are you ever going to unpack? So that ongoing discussion and sharing with each other, um, I think yeah. it's good. Yeah. I don't think we're ever finished learning. I mean, I, I am pretty I active on social media and attending all kinds of PL. So I think um, to, to assume that we can just tell this is what needs to be done and not provide the support that that surrounds that that wraparound is you know we're not doing teams much of a service if we're not supporting them through what that process looks like and helping them I, they, we know this about learning in general but discourse is so important discourse is how we unpack what we're thinking and it's how we start to articulate and re-articulate and revise what we know based on how our experiences change us. So with AAC, you know, it is, it has historically been my experience that I get, you know, I get two slots in the whole school year. You can do a three hour training at this day and this day, and that's it. Or administrators will say, you can meet, I, my team needs to be trained. And so I get that one and done, and then maybe I can revisit it in the spring. <laughs> And it's so evident that that doesn't work. We have a ton of evidence that says that that doesn't work. So I think it's um, figuring out different ways to do this. The other thing about Master Pell is it doesn't have to be a three hour training. I mean, most of these can be delivered in a half an hour. So it's easier to fit it in at the beginning of the day or the end of the day or over a lunch break, I've done it. Um, well, and it really <laughs> lends itself to uh, a coaching model that we're you know, learning mm -hmm. more and more about is as this Absolutely. Goes on. Um, there was a question from Shana. She said, have you had cultural barriers when it comes to presuming potential? Parents or staff who don't believe that it's necessary to introduce things that are beyond them. I think you spoke to that a little bit, but talk to us more. Yeah, um, I think that, cult yes, I think that cultural barriers definitely exist with that particular module. Um, again, I that is a module that I, I think does need to be taken a bit slower. And it, I always come back to this idea that mindsets can't be mandated. They have to be shifted through experience, exposure, information, opportunity. So we have to really think about how do, how do we provide that? Um, I think, so again, that module includes lots of videos and it includes statements from other families to help to, to nudge and sort of poke away at those, to provide some of those foundational experiences. But as we're working with kids, like if there's a cultural barrier with a family member related, you know, we feel like we, we are presuming potential in a way that we want to, we want to bring the family on board with us. 
if we can take videos of the students doing something and then, you know, even by the act of us attributing meaning, we are really helping to guide what that interaction looks like. And then if we can show that to a family, we can start to nudge it. But I think for a lot of people, it doesn't happen all at once that you really have to sort of whittle away at their past experiences that have brought them to that place. And even our cultural norms that put a lot of people in that place, we have to um, be thoughtful about shifting the needle for, for folks and, and recognize that it's a journey, it's not an event. Um, Um, Karen wants to know, uh, can you comment a little bit on how this has worked for you and on uh, particularly on modeling in a virtual school environment in a blended learning environment? How's it been working for you? Um, so I do not have a classroom, so I haven't, I haven't been able to, um, do you mean delivering Master Pal? Yeah, or, yeah. It, to be honest with you, I had um, I was working with two teams that I was super excited to support because they were going to let me do some um, some thoughtful data collection, so we could start to get some pre and post ideas about how it shapes the you know people's um, knowledge uh, knowledge skills and, and habits around modeling. And then COVID happened and we closed down. <laughs> so currently in my district, there's actually a moratorium on professional learning because. Um, because everyone is really saturated. I think they did a ton of professional learning in the spring and over the summer and this fall, they're really trying to, to pull that back. Um, so everything is by choice. And right now nobody's choosing um, to invite, to, to, to have this conversation. So I think it's very, I think it's definitely doable over, I, it's amazing the things that I think have been doable over um, video conferencing. I feel like it's opened up a huge world for us um, to be able to connect with families in ways that we have just not been able to do that before. So I think about, you know, when I have worked with, there's individual kids that I've consulted with, not sharing Master Pal per se um, as an ongoing piece, but the, the ability to coach families through video conferencing has just been an incredible boon to my practice. You know, we, we know that there's a, a lot of interest in that topic of blended learning and virtual practice. So I want to encourage people who are on the calls to um, share their uh, experiences and their thoughts too, if, if you have them. Um, you can unmute yourself and talk if you'd like. Mm, <coughs> Write any other questions you may have. Whoops, you went away. I have a couple more slides if we no. want to go through them that just look at the different ways that I've implemented Master Pal. Okay, Kathleen, um, you have a comment? And I saw you unmuted yourself. No, no, sorry. Okay. <laughs> go ahead, Tim. Are you intimidated? Then if there are more <laughs> questions after that, we can dive into that. Okay. And, and Tabby, one thing that I, I always think of whenever you talk about these activities, they are activities that whenever we have uh, we any child, uh, and even before we know that they're able to, we take them to the refrigerator and we say, oh, mommy's going to make your, and we talk on, in this manner, and it's a lot of what we normally do. But as soon as a family realizes that they're not getting the feedback or they don't know how to respond to mm -hmm. Thing, and that difficulty comes in with our complex communicators, it becomes a mystery. But when yeah. you take away that mystery, you go back to doing what you would always do as a parent and, and look for those signs that, oh, he loves to hear dad's car keys. All right, now how do we shape that? She loves the smell of mom's perfume. What can we do with that? So it just seems like going back to this is what we do. <laughs> yes, I think that um, there's a there's throughout Master Pal, there's a lot of emphasis on understanding that on, on looking to language development to guide our practice, not just what it looks like for the student to develop skills, but what does it look like for us to provide feedback about how to develop those skills so that, you know, the way that we assign language to the child's actions, you know, we, we, we um, guide our interactions by labeling and describing and, and providing that language input. But you're, you're absolutely providing right. Providing consistent 
providing consistent vocabulary, I think, when you say people are always questioning, hey, what's this? Okay, now somebody who's got slow processing, you're asking them to go through their file doors and come up with this name when we're not even sure if we are on the same page of what to call yeah. Anyway, go ahead with your slides. <laughs> Just some thoughts. Okay. We're not advancing. Hold on. Technology. Okay. Um, so, a couple things to know. The facilitator guideline, I already touched on this, it really gives you everything you know to guide the discussion and the learning. Um, there's no secrets. It gives you tips about you know, delivery and, and all of that. Throughout MasterPal, there's parallel structure in each of the slide decks. So, there's an introduction, there are, there's a warm up discussion. And the warm-up discussion really allows people to think about how does this topic relate to me? So it helps to create relevance. It's also pretty low key. So it sets the stage for people to share and feel safe in sharing. Um, I know that it's, if when I'm looking at time constraints, that always feels very negotiable, that warm-up discussion, but it's been my experience that not doing the warm-up discussion actually shifts the whole tone of the interaction and makes it a little less kind of warm and friendly and um, casual, if you will. Also within the parallel structure, the key idea is defined. So it's very clear from the beginning what is being unpacked through that topic. And then it always ends with a summary of um, the key concepts, again, are kind of restated and, and, and revised. Um, and then just this summer, I added self-reflection guidelines. So the self-reflection guidelines, again, are to help people, there's a pre-reflection question to see, you know, just to allow people to brain dump, like, what do I already know about this? There's some retrieval practice that's included. So um, folks get the opportunity to just, you know, revisit a couple of the terms and terminology or key ideas. Um, and then there's an invitation to think about like, what does this look like in your world? Like how does this information apply to your students? And then in the, the very last part of it is just affirmation of your learning again, where those key concepts are just strictly stated and folks check those off. Or if they have questions about them, they bring those questions and then that adds to the discussion. So that's just a couple things to know about how the modules are, are shaped. Um, some lessons that I've learned as I've done this, one is that the modules can be shared in any order. Um, I've started to really group them under these umbrellas because as it turns out, very seldom am I, am I kind of offered 10 different time slots over the course of a year. People really tend to want to get through it a, more, a little more quickly, um, but we can't do 10 times, we can do six times. So I'll start, a, I'll start to chunk them together. Um, but depending on who the audience is, or if certain people are only available for certain times, that influences which I choose for which time slots. And just like we've shared, this is really intended to be shared over time. This is an ongoing support and ongoing conversation so that we can all learn and, and sustain that get discourse. Um, I invite you to make it your own. You know, I've kind of put these pieces out there, but they're not, they're, um, you know, I'm not proprietary about it. Just take it and use it. This is, this is, I want teams to be able to benefit from this comfort, this information. So um, another thing is that allowing time for discussion is important. So time for brainstorming and sharing successes, time to kind of dig into those real life challenges and build community um, really helps people to be invested in this ongoing conversation. So what it can look like, um, some of the ways that I have, have offered Master Pals um, I think the, the time that I most enjoy, the, the best kind of experience that I had with it was when I was facilitating discourse between staff and families. And this was just a really incredible um, time when families were really initiating the need for the conversation and the staff were on board and the, the administrator brought me in. And I think we did, we did, I think six sessions over a four month period. And um, it was just really fantastic to have that, that conversation with staff and families all coming to understanding on the same page. And again, that discussion was just amazing. Um, we've also done it in terms of targeted support for paraprofessionals. So we looked at all the two hour early dismissals across the school year and we plugged those in and we had groups of paraprofessionals attend across the school year during those times. Um, I have had teams in, um, or I've had administrators initiate it where I, we create a community between classrooms. So in a given school, you know, certain classrooms were targeted. And so they came together for professional learning. Um, it can be used to support groups of, of speech pathologists. And then I have a principal in a neighboring district who actually made this her PL for the entire school year or her staff. So their monthly PL um, 
they got, I think she had funding so that staff could participate for either an hour before or an hour after school. And she facilitated it and she, it allowed her to have this shared language and shared goals and shared understandings across her school. So she, um, you know, she, she really reached out to me and, and shared what an amazing experience that was. With all of this, collaborating with administrators is key because you have to be able to get teams together. Um, you have to have either leave or some, you know, uh, coverage or whatever that looks like, but that's a really key component. Um, another thing to just, that I kind of feel the need to share is that Angelman Syndrome family organizations have been um, amazing in, you know, they've really embraced MasterPAL and they, um, these organizations are very focused on communication and literacy. So in general, I feel like they are generating resources that the entire AAC community can really benefit from. Um, and a couple of groups have reached out and there are elements of translation. Um, I don't know if an entire, I think, I think all of Master, most of MasterPAL has been translated into one of these, but elements of MasterPAL is being translated into multiple languages um, because of the investment of these organizations. So that's really exciting. And uh, as we, as we uh, as our last guest, um, last guest on our uh, Echo Voice is Aaron, oh. uh, talked about the process. And so that Angelman piece is something that the two of you have in common. Yes. It's great when great people get together and share. Yeah, Aaron and I have collaborated quite a bit of late. <laughs> That's wonderful. And so Aaron will also be at our uh, conference in the spring. And so uh, some great learning, some great things going on. Yeah. I'm seeing that we are coming to the end of our time. Um, any final words uh, that you'd like to share with okay. us? Okay. These last two slides, they're in your handout, so I won't go over them, but they really just invite you to develop an action plan and to recognize what you're doing that's great because we're all doing great things and we all have room to learn. So being able to identify the awesome focus on areas of improvement and create an action plan is really what moves us along as a field. So I won't go into those, but that's just kind of, you know, my end summary and those are in your, your handout. Um, you have given us so much to think about and the comments that are coming in are all those of praise and thanking you and your insight and being able to share and share so freely. Um, it's, it's so great to have you here today. Gail and I have been hearing your name coming from so many different directions. It's great to finally welcome you to Oregon, even if it is only virtually. I'm glad to be here. And so the handouts, the recording will be posted. Um, we will uh, take your feedback on uh, how it is that we can help and support you in your continued learning. Uh, we are listening and we are trying to uh, find uh, the trainings and the support that and bring it all together. Uh, Tabby, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and uh, Tabby's coming uh, to us from West Virginia, so she's three hours ahead of us, but um, we love the way that we can bring people so far away, so close through um, our Zoom and through our networks. Uh, Gail, Thank you, as always. Great topic. I look forward to digging into the handouts and learning more. Happy Every I hope you're looking at the chat box because it's just a rolling thank you. <laughs> it is. And well, I thank I, you I, all for being here. I'm so proud of, of you, Tabby. I have to say that. And, and when we start seeing, I'm seeing so many new names today that I have not seen before. So we must be doing something right and bringing all the great stuff. So there you are, Tabby, uh, ranking among the greats. Just <laughs> look at the feedback. It's all thank yous. And you have helped the um, Oregon teams to better help Oregon learners. And that's what- yeah, Well, I appreciate you having me um, and I, reach out if you have questions. Um, I hope it's useful. Okay, thank you so much. Everyone take care of you. Uh, sincerely wishing you blessings and great health and we will see you on December 4th, if not before when we talk to Jane Corston about every move counts. Thank you all. Take care of you.